Today's show is brought to you by NASDAQ Asset Owner Solutions. NASDAQ Asset Owner Solutions is a technology-powered ecosystem that delivers transparency and decision support throughout the investment lifecycle by uniting eVestment, the industry's most comprehensive institutional data, with Solovis, which delivers true multi-asset class portfolio analytics. See why over a 1,000 asset owners and allocators around the world, from the world's largest sovereign wealth funds to single-family offices and everything in between, rely on NASDAQ's comprehensive data, award-winning technology, and expert services for managing their portfolios. Visit nasdaq.com slash asset owner solutions for more information. Today's show is also sponsored by ThirdBridge. ThirdBridge is a widely used provider of expert interview transcripts whose clients include past guests on the show. Their content covers both public and private companies in any sector across all the major geographies around the world. To give you a sense, last year, over 16,000 investment professionals from 1,000 firms across private equity, public equity, and credit downloaded approximately 500,000 interview transcripts from ThirdBridge Forum. Each of those transcripts covers a one-hour in-depth interview between an unbiased sector analyst and an industry executive. I've seen the platform and the coverage is incredible, ranging from mature mega caps to leading edge innovators like Stripe and SpaceX, to thematic topics like crypto exchanges and alternative energy in China, to just about everything in between. ThirdBridge created this category of research and has by far the largest content platform available. If you're an asset manager or capital allocator looking to better understand your manager's positioning, visit thirdbridge.com slash capital for a try. Hello, I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can join our mailing list and access premium content at CapitalAllocators.com. All opinions expressed by Ted and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of capital allocators or their firms. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of capital allocators or podcast guests may maintain positions in securities discussed on this podcast. My guest on today's show is Rob Citrone, the founder of Discovery Capital Management, a $2 billion global hedge fund investing across equities, fixed income, currencies, and rates with a focus on emerging markets. Rob is one of the longest standing managers in the space and the largest investor in his fund. He trained under Julian Robertson in the heyday of Tiger Management in the mid-90s before launching Discovery in 1999. Since then, the firm grew to a peak of $15 billion in assets, and despite the subsequent reduction in AUM, he and his team of 42 are still going strong. Our conversation dives into Rob's background, lessons he learned from Fidelity, Julian Robertson, and George Soros, and the launch of Discovery. We discuss his investment strategy, research process, perspective on markets around the world, ups and downs in the business, and managing an organization through change. Rob doesn't often share his insights in the public forum, so it was a real treat to get inside the mind of one of the best in the business. I'd like to invite you to attend a special boot camp on decision-making I'll be teaching on July 20th at 11 a.m. Eastern. I'll share actionable frameworks with special clips from Annie Duke, the legendary decision-making expert, best-selling author, and former professional poker player. The one-hour webinar is one of the most popular classes of Capital Allocators University and is chock full of insights to take back to your team in the investment office. The cost to attend is $250, and Capital Allocators Premium members will receive a 50% discount. If you're interested in attending and are not yet a premium member, you may want to consider subscribing first and receiving our library of transcripts, weekly email, and a whole bunch more for effectively half off the first year of membership. Log on to CapitalAllocators.com and click University to register for the bootcamp. Before you do that, click on Premium 
and sign up. Hope to see you on July 20th. Please enjoy my conversation with Rob Citrone. Rob, thanks so much for joining me. Oh, really a pleasure, Ted. Thank you for having me. Why don't we go back prior to your launching Discovery? I know that was a while ago, but would love to hear your investing background, how you first got in the business. As a little kid growing up, I wasn't really familiar with investing, very modest roots. But I had a lot of odd jobs and started mowing grass when I was 12 years old for like a buck and a quarter an hour. Saved my money, just put it in the bank. And then, of course, that was in the late 70s then. And all of a sudden, interest rates got double digits. So I put my money into money market funds. And then after a few years, those went to 15, 16% yields. And then yields started to fall. And so I started to take my money and put it into mutual funds. And then I started picking individual stocks. And I was just doing this on my own. And I really loved it. So I knew I wanted to get in the investment field. I didn't really know anything about it. I did very well in school. I was valedictorian in my high school and my college class. By the time I was senior in high school, I knew this is what I wanted to do. So I went and got a math and economics degree at Hamden City College and knew I'd get my MBA at some point after that, but went to work for Wall Street for a year at what was then First Boston. It was a very interesting year because the crash of 87 happened. We had the Latin American debt crisis. I was doing a lot of stuff on Latin American debt issues for First Boston. So that's how I got into emerging markets. From there, I went to got my MBA at the University of Virginia. I was the second youngest kid in the class because I had just a year of experience. And then went to work for Fidelity Investments up in Boston to head up their emerging market fixed income and currency group to start that. What an entree into the field. At the time, they were restructuring a lot of the Latin American debt and the Brady bonds. And we got involved in buying some of this debt. And the yields were 25% in dollars. These things performed incredibly well. The countries were in kind of a boom time in Latin America in the early 90s. So I moved up to start managing some funds there. I managed part of Magellan Fund for a while launched some of our own emerging market fixed income funds. And then there was a fellow that worked at Fidelity named James Lyle, who worked at Tiger. Julian was looking for somebody to do emerging markets. So James said, I got the perfect guy for you. So it was about a six-month interview process with Tiger. It was a pretty thorough process for sure. I had to talk to Julian a number of times, talk to him about the markets, what I thought. And then I joined in uh, Jan 95 after almost five years at Fidelity. So starting in 87, getting going after the Latin debt crisis... Both of those times, markets crashed, to some extent came right back. And I'm curious what you took away from those experiences. Well, I can remember the crash in 87, and I can remember it was one of the longest days that I ever experienced. I mean, I think we just stared at the screens, and we just were in shock that the equity market was down 20-some percent in a day. We were like frozen. But then the Fed came in and just eased liquidity massively. It was an interesting time to buy, obviously, and we could see that and feel that. That's why things recovered very quickly. The amount of liquidity they pumped into the system had a huge impact. I think that's very different than today because today the problem is we can't do that. We've already done that. Now we have to go the other way. We have to actually take liquidity out of the market. Even if the market were to crash, there's not much the Fed can do because of the inflation issue. So they're really caught in a difficult bind. I think we're moving to the second phase of the market correction where the first phase was inflation and the Fed having to get more aggressive and way behind the curve just to catch up. And they still haven't caught up yet, but they're in the process of catching up. But I think the second phase is this significant withdrawal of liquidity. I mean, if QE had a major impact on asset prices rising, we've done $6 trillion of it, $3 trillion of it in a very quick period of time during the pandemic. As we take $3 trillion out, it has to have a significant impact on asset prices, in my view. And we haven't even started. This is so different than in 87. The other thing is, back in 87, the number of investors in the market, the breadth of the market in the US in terms of people in 401ks, it was tiny. Today, so many people have huge amounts of their wealth in the market, especially in the United States. And so I think this is going to have a much bigger impact on the economy with the correction we're seeing than most think. I think we're in a real substantial slowdown at the same time we have to tighten policy and got to keep tightening because we have an inflation problem. Any parallels with all the different crises you've seen over time in emerging markets? The one big difference for the US is that we're the reserve currency of the world. Even during times of crisis, we have strengthening in our currency. As a result, our interest rates don't have to go as high as they otherwise would, or inflation doesn't get as high. So I actually think inflation is rolling over. It's just going to take longer to come down to the acceptable levels, but it's rolling over. It's peaked in our view. The real risk on the headline is energy prices and maybe food prices. I mean, maybe headline can go a little bit higher, but core has definitely peaked. It's already three months in a row, year over year, it's come down and even month over month come down. So we think core inflation's peaked. We think it's going to come down, but unfortunately, it's just not going to come down fast enough where the Fed can stop. The US, we have a huge advantage. In the EM, a lot of these currency crises then would lead to debt crises because the currency would devalue so much they then couldn't pay their debt that was denominated in another currency. We have all our debt in our own currency, so we can actually print the money, which we've done in the past, and we're actually inflating our debt away right now. So debt is not a big problem in the U.S. at the moment. The inflation is the big issue. We circle back to your background. There are two legendary organizations. Fidelity Magellan, Peter Lynch, back in the day, was the number one fund in the country. What was it like being part of that team? 
Well, when I had joined, he was just leaving, moving on from managing Magellan every day. A gentleman named Morris Smith was managing it. Incredibly talented guy. I got a chance to work closely with him. He wanted part of the fund to be invested in EM debt. And it was a huge fund at the time. So I was a very small part of the assets. But I did that for a lot of funds at Fidelity. So it was a great experience. I mean, it was a very entrepreneurial place when I was there. Really came up with ideas. We were very early on in the EM debt and currency space. When I was there, and I was kind of head of research and also managed some of the funds, we had $7 billion of assets in the market. And at the time, I think the next biggest competitor had a billion. So we were very large. It was a great experience for me because I got a chance of what it was like to manage large sums of money. And there's some difficulties with that. It makes it a bit more challenging. But I also got access to all the key people in all these countries we were investing in, whether it be sometimes the president or the head of the central bank or finance ministers, Congress. And did a lot of trips over those years. I've done 33 years of this now in EM. And I've been to Argentina and Brazil over 52 times each, for instance, and China 12 times, and even Russia six times, Turkey 12 times. So I've traveled the world and it's been an amazing experience. And it gives me a really interesting context when we're investing in these countries going forward, because I've been there. I've grown up with some of those countries as they've developed over the years, and the changes are immense. I can remember going to China the first time I went there in Shanghai. I was at the Hyatt, and I remember getting woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning. I look out, and it is like a traffic jam of bicycles. I've never seen anything like it in my life. It was incredible. And then you go back three years later, and there's tons of cars. In Shanghai, when they had Pudong, which just weeds, it was just fields. And then they said, well, this can be one of the biggest economic developments in the history of the world. And I kind of didn't believe it. And then when I saw the buildings they built, it was like a ghost town of high rises. I was like, man, it was maybe the biggest development in the history of the world, but it's going to be the biggest disaster and the losses are going to be enormous. And then a year later, it's completely populated. They were able to bring the people in, force them in, but it was an interesting place to be. And that was just incredible. So I've seen things that you never could imagine. And it gives me some pretty good perspective. So I feel very fortunate to have done that over the years. What was that six-month interview process with Julian like? Back in the day, it was fairly legendary for his test and all of these things he did in the interview process. We had intelligence tests to take, personality tests. We had to talk to Dr. Stern, a psychologist, and it was fascinating. I love the investment part of it because Julian and I used to talk about different investment ideas and a lot of things that he was interested in. He was always interested in Brazil because we had a lot of investors from Brazil at Tiger. He was interested in what was happening around the world. Back then in the 90s, the big trade that Tiger had and where Julian made tons of money was a macro trade. He did it through individual stocks, but we were short Japan and long the US. And that was a massive macro trade. It was one of the most brilliant macro trades ever. And it was for a decade. In the late 80s, everybody thought Japan was taking over the world. The Nikkei was over 40,000. It went down to like 9,000. It was one way train down while the US market in the 90s was just a fantastic upward movement. So that was the key. I give Julian credit because we used to always mark down every quarter, we'd lose 10% in Japanese equities because they would always ramp the equities into the end of the quarter at their fiscal year into March. But he stuck with it. I think we were a little smarter towards the end where he would lighten up in the first quarter on the short side and then put it back on towards the end of the month. But man, he stuck with that through thick and thin. It was the bedrock of Tiger's returns in the 90s, which were really the spectacular returns that Julian had. When you think back to the time from 95 to roughly 2000 when Julian folded up, the talent inside of the old Tiger became fairly legendary in the hedge fund business. All these people spun out. What was that internal culture like? I think that we were all hard workers. We were all dedicated to what we were doing. We all wanted to succeed. But I think Julian did a great job of putting people together who worked together as a team. We really supported each other. We helped each other. We had these Friday lunches where we had to come in with an idea that we wanted to present and also an idea we wanted to take out of the portfolio. So we had to be prepared and we had to go up against one of our colleagues in a different area. But it was done in a very cordial manner, but in a way that people did their homework. No doubt. I think the hiring process, because it was so meticulous, I think they hired the best people. And I think that's why it was so successful. And that's why I think a lot of people who've gone on from Tiger have become great investors. But we also learned a lot from Julian. You know, I thought you could say two great institutions was working with Tiger, but I also managed a lot of money for the Soros family for over 20 years. And I used to speak to George very frequently the first five years or so, almost every day. And I ran what he called part of the back book for sort of was whatever I could convince him to put in the portfolio, he'd put in. <laughs> and these were huge compared to the size of the fund back then. But man, what a master trader George was. He just had a feel for the market. He knew when things were going to change. And he was always so good at picking up what are the key issues, one or two things you have to really focus on. He didn't focus on everything. It's just a trade idea. He's got the key thing right. It didn't matter about the other things. So I really feel like I worked with one of the best stock pickers and fundamental bottoms up guy in Julian Robertson of all time, who also had a good macro feel. And then a master trader in George Soros. They were totally different in how they approached things, but there are two things I learned from them that they did the same. The first thing is when they lost conviction in an idea, they got out. 
They didn't wait around. They didn't get half the position out. They just got out of the position. And they took whatever the market price was. They didn't, uh, well, I'm going to wait for a better product. No, because what happens? It tends to go against you and you never get out of the position. They get out at a much worse level. And then the second thing they did is they always cross-reference their ideas. So if I'd go to Julian with an idea, and he'd say, okay, if it's on Brazil, let's say I wanted to own the Brazilian Real. He would say, well, what do our other investors or partners think about that? Or who else can I talk to about that? And we'd always cross-reference. And George did the same thing. And the Rolodexes both of them had were incredible. I mean, during the crisis in 07, it was in the fall and TARP had just fallen and the market was a mess. Lehman had gone down. George said, well, what do you think is the big next problem? And I said, George, there's a big problem in Eastern Europe. And if Eastern Europe comes down, then Western European banks are going to go down and then it's just going to cascade this crisis everywhere. And he said, well, what can we do about that? I said, Western Europe has a lot of money that they can actually lend to the Eastern European countries. Western European banks could say they would have a standstill where they won't take the money out. And the IMF can do a big program for them. And he said, that's a great idea. Let's get Gordon Brown on the line. 10 seconds later, Gordon Brown's on the line. And the next day I see in the paper, Gordon Brown has a big plan to save Eastern Europe. <laughs> and uh, that's what transpired. So his Rolodex was incredible, but he would always cross-reference his ideas as many people he thought that knew something about it. I learned that. I try to do the same thing. And it's not easy. When you lose conviction to get out, it's not an easy thing. You think it sounds easy. But I think learning those two things from those two gentlemen and having that experience for those years is incredible. And then the Fidelity experience was fantastic as well. So I'm very blessed with all that. What was the impetus for you leaving Tiger to set up your own shop? When I was leaving Fidelity, I almost went and did my own thing. And then I thought, you know, I, I need some more experience, an opportunity to work with Tiger and Julian would be a great opportunity. And so let me do that. I think what I really learned at Tiger, the biggest thing was how to short. I hadn't done much shorting at Fidelity. That's a skill that is really a lost art these days. And there aren't many people who can short securities and do them effectively. And I think I learned a lot from Julian in that. I had always wanted to go out and start my own thing. And then at Tiger, I missed managing the actual money. At Fidelity, I had portfolios that actually managed the portfolio. Pulling the trigger and making the decision, that's a key thing. It's something I really enjoy and something that motivates me. At Tiger, I didn't have that. I mean, you're really an analyst to Julian. In the end, Julian ultimately makes the final decision. You just have to convince them to have a portfolio of your longs and shorts, but you don't determine exactly when to buy and sell them. You have to convince Julian to do that. So I missed that. So I knew that at some point I would go out and launch my own fund. I left a year before Tiger shut down. I didn't know Tiger was going to shut down, but it was just a perfect time for me. And it's been four and a half years there, and it was a great four and a half years. What were those key lessons in shorting that you learned your time there? One is you've got to be incredibly careful because there's an unlimited loss in shorts. You don't want to ever have any of the shorts too large, but you also want to have shorts that the skew is so much in your favor. Like if you're long, you lose 10 or 15. If you're right, you make 75 or 80. And those were the best shorts. I mean, the best short I ever had at Tiger was the Thai bot. We shorted a huge amount of Thai bot before the 97 crisis in Thailand. I can remember they moved the band stronger against us. So at one point we were losing $225 million on the position. Julian said, you still have conviction in this. And I said, Julian, I have tremendous conviction. This is just completely unsustainable. Interest rates where they are, the whole banking system will just collapse. They can't keep it there. They have no reserves left. It's going to go. And it devalued about a month later, about 40%. There is where a skew was really in our favor. And even though we took some losses, we had a huge skew in that direction. The other thing is, is shorts are working. It's tough, but you need to keep the position on. Let's say you start with a 3% short. It halves. It's only 1.5% now. So Julian would always say, well, the best shorts go down 90%. They don't go down 40 or 50%. They go down 90%. If you have that conviction and you have the thesis, especially a broken stock or a broken situation like Thailand, those corrections were enormous. I can remember we were shorting the red chips in China in 97, 98. These were companies that were in China but listed in Hong Kong, and they had these big parents in China. They had something called asset injection. They kept shifting assets into the listed entity, and the Chinese were going crazy about it. I was like, this doesn't make any sense, Julian. These things are overvalued by a mile. I think we were down 40% on the position at one time overall. And he said, Rob, make sure you're on top of this. I said, Julian, these things are just crazy. I said, this is going to have to stop. And by the way, nobody talks about the debt that they had to take on to take on these assets because they buy them from the parent company. He said, Rob, they're not going to go down 40%, Rob. They're going to go down 90%. They went down 90%. And I can remember the first short I ever put on at Tiger, it was during the Mexican tequila crisis in 95 in January. And we shorted two construction companies in Mexico. At one point, we were down pretty large on the shorts in April with the package that the Treasury put together for Mexico. These things squeezed against us, but we kept them. But I remember when I left, we were still short both of those companies that were basically bankrupt. Five years later, Julian calls me and he says, Rob, can you find any of those Trabasa certificates? He says, I can't get any of these certificates and you know, I need to close these short. Somebody's got to have them somewhere as wallpaper or something. Please find me some of these certificates. The first two shorts I ever put on Tiger, the day I left, they were still there and they were essentially bankrupt companies. So I'm curious how you bring those two things together. So on the one hand, you've got this asymmetric risk and you got to be careful when you're shorting stocks. On the other, you're saying things as they're going down, you want to keep the position on if you have conviction. And I imagine if something's going to go down 
90%, it goes down 80 and then it gets cut in half. But when these things get small, they can also rip against you. So how do you balance that desire to monitor your risk with the conviction that you need to press shorts? I think the best shorts are ones where there's either a fundamental flaw in the business model or is ultimately going to go bankrupt. Those are really the best shorts. If you could find all those shorts, it'd be fantastic. A lot of shorts you can't find, there can be catalysts that can correct them 30 or 40%. And those, you just have to know the difference between the two. That's why the conviction level is so high. So normally as a stock goes down, conviction level might go down in terms of what you said at the lower price, it may not be as attractive to be short. And that's true. And you just have to know which ones could have financial distress and which ones might not. It's really an art. It's a lost art these days. You don't see as many people shorting individual stocks, but I think now's the time to be short individual stocks. It has been for the last few months, and I think that's going to continue for a while. So when you brought all this together, Discovery, say 20 years ago, even today, you mentioned stock experience, you mentioned emerging debt experience, and then currencies as well. And I'm curious how you brought it all together into what your investment strategy has been. We use a top-down and a bottom-up strategy where we have macro analysts looking at the macro situation and then bottom-up individual stock analysts that help us pick the securities. And I would say that we generate probably 80% of our ideas from our macro side of things, but then we can populate them with securities that are much more efficient using the bottom-up analysis. We learn a lot from our bottom-up analysis as well on the macro. So they kind of feed each other and they play in beautifully. One area we've always had analysts in is in technology. I think if you don't understand what's going on in technology in this world, you're at a big disadvantage, even if you're just a macro investor and just doing macro. So I think it's always helped us quite a bit. Also, I find that in a lot of these markets, especially in emerging markets, the equity markets are really the most inefficient markets. They tend not to react as quickly as the currency or the debt. So a lot of times we can take advantage of that. And in some of the equity positions we will have, we will do like a basket approach in a certain country where you know, we want to be short financials or something in a particular country, and we'll pick the five or six best banks to be short as an example. It's important, I think, to do both. And Tiger did both. I think I was influenced a lot by what Tiger did and how they did it and how Julian did it. I think it's a great model, and we've replicated that for 23 years. How did you think about covering the world across asset classes in a competitive landscape and everything that you're doing is something I know you've done for a long time. I've always marveled at your ability to stay on top of everything that's happening. I think a couple of things. One is you've been doing it for 33 years. You have a great context and a lot of experience. And the other thing is just a network. I mentioned Julian and George's Rolodex. I think that my Rolodex into these local key players and a lot of cases, policymakers in a lot of these countries is very important. And so there's a lot of times that things aren't interesting. Like, for instance, Latin America to us has been interesting for the last decade to a large degree. There's been not a lot much to do. And we actually think now going forward, it might be very interesting. So I can easily pick up the phone or go and travel and meet people that I've known for years and kept in touch with. They can get me up to speed very quickly in what's happening either in Argentina or Brazil or Mexico. And my analysts have also been following it on a continuous basis. So it's a huge advantage to be able to have more tools in the toolbox and then be able to go to that toolbox when it's interesting either long or short. So we'll then hone in once we find a few things. Like, for instance, we think maybe the best short in the world is Turkey right now. Um, Turkey CDS has gone from about 400 over now to 800 over. We think it's going well over 1,000. The country is going to experience a traditional currency and credit crisis, as we've seen in EM, with really bad policy. If minus 50 billion in reserves, they've spent the entire deposits in the banking system for the individual has been spent. People in Turkey don't understand that the dollars aren't there anymore. The market isn't fully aware of how difficult the situation is. Inflation's now running away in Turkey, 70, 80%. They still intervene in the currency. At some point, it's just going to blow up. So that's a great example where we're spending a lot of time on Turkey, where six, seven years ago, we were doing nothing in Turkey. But having been to Turkey, I have a lot of contacts there. and It gives us a big advantage, myself plus my team. My team's been around for a long time and a lot of experience in these markets. So we're going to take a quick break from the conversation to tell you about Visible Alpha. Visible Alpha built a platform in partnership with 160 brokers to analyze consensus data and financial metrics on over 6,000 publicly traded companies globally. Visible Alpha extracts data from every line item across sell-side models so you can better understand expectations on metrics beyond just revenue and earnings without having to dig through models one by one. Try Visible Alpha for free by visiting visiblealpha.com slash TED. And now, back to the show. How do you think about constructing a portfolio across all these markets and different asset classes? I start by thinking about what do I think overall about the markets and risk in general? What do I think direction of equity markets is? What do I think the direction of the dollars and what's the direction of interest rates? From there, I begin to populate the positions by where I think the weaknesses are or the strengths are. Over my investing lifetime, the U.S. has definitely been the main place to have your capital. 
It's been an incredible place to have it beyond any others by far. China rivaled it for a little while. I think that's really changing today. What I see happening in China is very concerning to me. I see a leader that is all about power. I think the economy is secondary, and he doesn't really understand that he may be destroying the long-term growth prospects for the country. If he stays in power, which it looks like he's going to, and he's got the same people around him, the same advisors, I think China is going to ultimately become an uninvestable market. And there's a lot of private equity money, global money stuck there, and they're the largest component of the EM Emerging Market Equity Index, over 30%. So there's tons of foreign money in China. And I think this is a big, big risk. And I think the whole key will become what happens in the leadership decision at the People's Congress later this fall. Two things I'd love to know about the rest of the year. One is what happens to the Ukraine-Russian war, which I still think remain a quagmire, unfortunately. But there was a resolution there. That's a big event for the world and for markets. And the second thing, who is going to lead China and what does the standing committee and the advisors look like going forward? I think those are the two most important questions to know from an investment perspective for the remainder of the year. Given that view on China, pretty bearish, what positions do you take? Well, we think the currency in China is a great short. So it's one of our larger positions. We're short the CNH. We do have some individual equity shorts there. We've been short China since August last year, but we have tempered it at the moment because there is a chance that Xi doesn't get the second term, which we think is maybe a 15% chance, and also a chance that he does get it, but with a lot of reformers around him. And in that case, I wouldn't be bearish on China. I think it actually could be positive. But if the current situation continues and we have the same kind of advisors and same kind of standing committee and the reformers really aren't there, then I think China's in serious, serious trouble. If your views on China play out over the next period of time, what does that mean for the rest of the world markets? I really think that we're in a process of moving to a massive Cold War of the West against China and Russia. I think that's terrible for returns and asset prices, and it's really bad, obviously, for Chinese assets. Obviously, Russian assets are already decimated. That's not going to change. But the interesting thing is if something were to change in Russia, if there would be a regime change or a big shift in what they're doing, there's an opportunity investment of a lifetime in Russian assets. These things are so depressed. And I saw it happen in 98. A lot of the oligarchs that are around today and a lot of wealth generated happened after the 98 crisis. And they bought their companies for a song. They're even cheaper today. And I saw some stocks trading right before they froze them in London and the US, some of these ADRs and GDRs trading at valuations that you don't want to support that regime. But these things were trading at 199th of where they traded six months ago. They're dominant companies in their country. And some of them are dominant companies in the world in terms of energy. Just a small amount of investment in those stocks that some people can retire on it because you're going to make 50 times your money on any regime change in a very quick period of time. So there's some tremendous opportunities going to come out of this, but it really is a problem for the world and a problem for this globalization, which was so prosperous for so many countries and so many people for so many years, I think is now unfortunately going in reverse. And I think this is going to be lower growth, higher inflation, and just a really tough environment if things don't change. We'll have to see what happens in October, November, but I'm very nervous about the continuation of the current regime, and I think it's really a disaster. Are there countries around the world where you're bullish today? Yeah. We're certainly bullish on the US long term. We're bullish on India. We think India will be the new growth country of the world. They've done a lot of reforms over a long period of time. There's some political risk if something happens to Modi. I think he's been great, but I think it's ingrained now in the country. I don't think they're going to go backwards. And it's a big market. The English language is a very helpful thing. The rule of law there is very good. That's the country that we have huge long-term interest in. As I mentioned before, I think Latin America is going to recover dramatically. I think Brazil's been in a 10-year recession. First time I can ever remember in my 30 years of an election in Brazil where the political risk really isn't rising very much. In fact, it's pretty stable because both candidates are known and more towards the center. One's on the left a little bit, one's on the right, but they're not that far from center. Brazil, I think, has a great opportunity with commodity prices where they are, with a very responsible Congress we've seen in place in Brazil now for a number of years. And I think at least a reasonable either continuation of Bolsonaro or Lula coming back. It'll be Lula 1, not Lula 2 in our view. And he wants to be the candidate of the market. He's mentioned that privately to people that we know. We think Brazil can be a fantastic opportunity. And we think there's very depressed asset prices there. You want to make money on rates coming down. Ultimately, it's inflation is peaking. Well, you can try in the US at 3.5% rates, or you can go to Brazil where they're 14%. Instead of 100 basis points, you can make 800 basis points. So that's something we're pretty excited about in the future. And the equities there as well. And the currency is incredibly competitive. And you get 12% net yield to own the Brazilian currency, as an example. Even Argentina, which is a basket case right now, going to have an election next year. We think they get a real significant change to market-oriented policies. And we think the country can recover very quickly. Next year might be the best performing market in the world on the back of that election. How about Africa? It's so difficult to invest because there's been so much political uncertainty and political chaos in the countries. You would think with commodities strong and that there would be some great opportunities there, but it's just very difficult to find those. And I think you can play them through Western companies that have a 
operations in Africa, and that's probably the best way to play it. I just think the stability of the governments just has been so poor. And South Africa had some bad leadership, and they're trying to come out of a real hole that the past president put them in, but I think they're really behind the eight ball and not very constructive on that. We don't really see much in Africa, unfortunately. With all the stimulus we've seen around the world over the last bunch of years, curious your views on sovereign debt markets. For a while, we felt that any developed bond market didn't make any sense. In fact, they were generally good shorts, and we were short most of them. Unfortunately, we covered a little bit too early. I don't really like any of the developed sovereign yields here. In fact, I think one of the best opportunities in the world, quite frankly, is in Japan, where they have the YCC program, where they have 10-year rates pegged at 25 basis points, 0 to 25. There's no way that's going to hold in this environment. That's one of the best fixed income shorts in the world today. You may not make 100 basis points, but it's 50 or 75 basis points to be made in the long end on the short side there, 10 years beyond. You mentioned earlier the importance of paying close attention to technology. I know it's something you've been involved with for a while. It's certainly changing a lot in the current markets and would love your perspective on different technology investments today. Technology is still a fantastic area to invest in going forward, but I still think that the multiples are still too high for most companies. Anytime a company's still being priced to sales or they're talking about the TAM, I want nothing to do with that company. Probably a short. So I think there's still a lot of pain to go in that area. And I think QT and the recession, and I think it's going to be a mild recession. It's going to be an interesting recession where it's not a service recession. Actually, things like travel will do very well. Usually travel does terrible in a recession. I think it's going to do very well because there's so much pent-up demand there. I think it'll be a mild recession. I think we'll be there very quickly by the end of the year, early next year in the U.S. But also it's going to be somewhat of a global recession. I mean, maybe China, if we get an okay outcome at the People's Congress, and China will recover some next year from an economic perspective because of what they've had with the COVID. I think technology is going to be one of the areas in the next year is going to be very, very challenged. Probably a lot of good shorts are coming out of there. So we don't really find much in technology on the long side at the moment. But I think long term, you have to be there. I think it's, it's really just a fantastic long term opportunity. I'd love to hear your views on developed Europe. Well, I think Europe is in serious trouble, and this Ukraine-Russian situation has just made it worse. I think Europe is, if not in recession now, will be in recession within a few months. The fact that you got 14 different countries in the euro, and they all want different policies, and just makes it so difficult. And I think it's going to be very difficult as they have to hike interest rates here, and you're going to see all of a sudden protect it, but it's not that easy because of the rules and the laws. So I think we might see an accident in Europe in the next... 18 months or two years as they try to come out of this big problem with the Russians. And this energy problem is huge. Their natural gas prices are six times what they are in the United States. The manufacturing facilities, they're not competitive. They need to shut them down. How this is going to work, I don't know. They need some resolution to the Ukraine-Russian situation as fast as possible. Otherwise, I think Europe is in really serious trouble. What's your favorite way to play it? I think ultimately there's going to be a fantastic short in Italian debt. I don't think it's yet. Next year is a very important election in Italy. I think you could have a real blowout and spreads there and something could crack in Europe. So that's something we're watching very closely. We're currently short the DAX. There's no energy companies there and a lot of big industrial companies. And as I said, the energy situation is very difficult for them. I think you're going to see significant misses in the earnings in the DAX as a whole. Right now, the DAX, we think, is the best way to play the situation in Europe. I'm really curious to ask you about portfolio management around all these different ideas and themes that you have. How many positions do you typically have on at any point in time? We have probably about 10 themes on at a time, and then each of those themes may have 10 to 15 positions. So we're between 120 to 150 positions. Actual individual securities may be larger than that because we'll take baskets. For instance, if I'm short banks in Turkey, I count that as one position and maybe five different banks. And it sounds like you've got a pretty bearish view overall. I'm curious how much you'll tilt your portfolio on a net basis, either long or short. Well, we'll get to 20, 25% net short if we really get incredibly concerned. And that's in equities, air credit. In currencies or rates you could be significantly more short. They're just not as volatile. We think of it, equities, vol is the highest, and then credit is about half of that, and then currency is about a third of equity vol, generally speaking. I'd love to take a step back from the portfolio and talk about your views on the hedge fund business. You've had a really interesting evolution over these 20 years. Share your experience on the ups and the downs and everything in between. I think it's a unique experience. I launched the fund in 99 right after Russia. Tremendous opportunity to invest at that point. In fact, the Turkish equity market in the month of December, in our fifth month, doubled. The market doubled. The whole market doubled. We made 22% that month on a net basis. But nobody wanted to invest because they were like, oh, I just put the money in the NASDAQ. That was right before 2000. It just goes up every year by 25% or more. We started the fund with $5 million with $1 million of fee pay money. Four of it was mine. You can't start a hedge fund today with $5 million. 
then we grew with a lot of performance, but also brought in assets. And I think at our peak, we were about 15 billion. So a little bit too large, grew too fast, too many people. I diluted our ideas and diluted my time. I'm very cognizant of that. So we now have a much smaller team, very experienced, but only have our best ideas. I'll never get back to that kind of size. It's just too large in these markets. And quite frankly, liquidity is worse today than it was 15 years ago, 10 years ago even. It's a great business. It's a wonderful challenge. You get some of the most talented people in the world doing this. The fees are lower. They're going to be lower. But I think hopefully in these tough markets in the next couple of years, that people will see that hedge funds have a place, that it's a great investment vehicle. We've gone through ups and downs, and I love the business. I love what I do every day. I feel like I have a front row seat to the world. The amount of contacts and insight and things that I have, whether it be Ukraine, Russia, or China, or the US even, Argentina, Brazil, Turkey, it's pretty phenomenal. I love it, and I think you have to love it to do this business well and to stick with it. I'd love to hear a bit more about the things you've learned along the way and how you operate. The problem is I had too many people to communicate with, and I had a lot of people who would communicate with me when I should be communicating with others. So that was the hard part. The other thing is that, as I mentioned before with George and Julian, they used to cross-reference all ideas outside the firm. So when you have too many people at the firm, you don't have enough time to do that. What we lost for a few years was I didn't communicate enough with all my other outside contacts. And so I need that time to be able to do that. So the smaller team helps me with that. My team's incredibly valuable in putting the ideas together and helping me come up with the ideas and refine the ideas. But then I need to verify them outside as much as I can. I really work quite a bit. We do things globally, obviously. So we have a 24-hour trading desk. I get woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning every night and have for 23 years. I see the close of Europe. I see the open of Asia. It really gives me an edge. I can feel what the markets are doing a little bit. We do some trading around that in a fair amount. It's been very helpful over the years. But I'll communicate with my analysts mostly verbally. I like to see them in person when I'm in the office or do a Zoom if I'm not. But I'll also text and email. Technology is so much better today. It's so much easier to communicate with your analysts on a frequent basis if you need to. But again, I think it's really important to try to not get groupthink within the organization, to be thinking and talking to people outside the organization that also look at these markets and these positions and see what they think and what's their view and how are we different and why are we different and what is our competitive edge and do we have an edge? Who are your favorite people to talk to on the outside cross-referencing? I like to speak to a lot of the senior people in some of these leadership roles, whether it be economic ministers in certain countries or central bankers. Very, very thoughtful. The central banks talk a lot to each other. I never really understood how much they do speak to each other, especially now through the BIS. They meet quite frequently and they do share ideas and thoughts. That's always very helpful to me. I have a lot of outside consultants, people I think over the years that have been very thoughtful on different countries or regions or topics. I got half from the Fidelity days, some I have from the Tiger days, and some we've developed the Discovery. A lot of them are paid consultants. Some of them are friends. And then I like to talk to other managers. A lot of my ex-Tiger guys that I worked with, people I worked with at Fidelity, and people I've met along the way. I like to talk to people who are actually in the markets and looking at different things. And some of them do individual stocks, some of them are macro people, some of them are currency, but people that I have respect for that I think do a good job and have been in the business for a long time. How do you go about balancing your own independent views with the views and positions of other people that you respect when you're doing that cross-referencing. And I'm particularly thinking about crowding, for example, on equities and the hedge fund side. I think that was a bigger issue when we were larger and needed really big ideas. Now, when I look at my portfolio, our ideas are so different than other people's ideas. I've went through my top 10 longs. Very few hedge funds would have any of the names I have in the top 10. The same thing on the short side. So I don't really think it's an issue anymore. Maybe in 2013, 14, 15, that period of time is a bigger issue. But today, we're doing so many independent things, so many interesting things, because we do a lot in EM and other places. A lot of the managers that I speak to don't do much there. Or if they do it, if I'll talk to a currency guy, he may have one or two currencies that I have on. It's a very eclectic portfolio in a way, and an eclectic group of people that I speak with. So that crowding issue is not anything that I see as an issue anymore. What's been the difference between the analysts that are still with you today in their talent and abilities compared to the ones that you decided to cull when you had to? They've proven to be able to make money in different environments. It's also a dedication. There is a high correlation between hard work and success. Those who work the hardest put everything into it and it's a massive priority for them. These are the ones that tend to do the best and they're never satisfied. They're always searching for the next best idea. And the thing that Julian always used to say and something that we try to do with Discovery and emulate that is we have good ideas, but we want to replace the good ideas with better ideas. So we're constantly looking for better ideas to replace the good ideas that we have. So the ones that can do that effectively, and also a good analyst has to be able to change his mind. The worst analyst is the one who just gets dug in his position and just says, okay, no, 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 even though the facts have changed, my view hasn't changed. That's the dangerous analyst. Being able to change your mind is a very valuable thing in this business. You have to be able to do it. 
So with this 24-7 trading around the world in markets that are open all the time for 20, 30 years, how have you gone about sustaining your energy to do this on such a difficult schedule? I have some diversions outside of the business that I love. I'm a huge sports fan, um, big fan of Pittsburgh teams. I'm a Pittsburgh Steeler fan. That's a great outlet for me. I also enjoy my kids and my family, playing golf, make sure I go out and do that on the weekends. I think that's important. I try to stay very healthy, stay fit. I eat better now than I used to eat. I get my blood tested every quarter and have different supplements and things like that that I take to make sure that everything's in balance. And so I actually feel better with more energy than I've ever felt. So using medical technology to be better and to be more fit and healthy. Have you been able to sleep? I think you develop that. I mean, I can sleep anywhere at any time. I can sleep on planes. I can sleep anywhere. No problem. And then when I wake up, I'm very alert and I can operate for 10 or 20, 30 minutes and then go right back to sleep. I think I've been able to develop that over the years. The key is the first three and a half hours that you sleep. So I always try to get to bed before 1130 because you need that first three and a half hour REM sleep. If you get that three and a half hour REM sleep, studies have shown that you'll be much more rested. And sometimes if you're not disturbed in that first three and a half hours, that's better sleep than seven hours disturbed in the first three and a half hours. They can call me during that time, but not very often. And it's only if it's something really big happening. We've seen a lot recently, maybe we saw it a little bit in 09 and increasingly hedge fund managers that had great success, assets were large, and then had a contraction in assets and, as you said, folded up. To go from where you were at the peak some years ago, 14, 15 billion to still real money, but say 2 billion today, what was that like in terms of what you had to do to the organization to keep going? We had the right size organization, but we did it in a very thoughtful way. We didn't just cut people across the board. Anybody that we had to let go, we tried to help them any way that we could and find something new. And I think we did a really great job of that. I'm very proud of that. What we did is just go to the key people that I felt were the most important in the lifeblood for discovery and give them packages that would be attractive enough for them to stay and the opportunity going forward. And I think we were very successful in doing that. I had to take a lot of money out of my own pocket to support the organization for the last couple of years, but I'm glad I've done it. And I think we're in a great position going forward from there. I see a lot of these funds. I don't want to pick on any one fund, but there's a couple of them that have had a bad year, bad two years after, like you said, strong performance, and they just close it up. In fact, wanted to close it up and start it again and get rid of the high water mark and support the organization on my own resources. But the other thing we did in 19, we thought we had a really bad year. We gave back our fees to our investors. I basically said, look, I think we just did a lousy job. I feel terrible about that. I don't feel like I earned any of my fees. Anybody who stays, I'm going to give credit back your management fees. Instead of closing down, I think we distinguished ourselves by sticking with our investors. We made their money all back and more in less than a two-year period. I'm very proud of that. That's the way we operate, and we cherish and value our investors tremendously. And When we lose money and don't do well, I really feel for my investors. That's the hardest part of the business. So as an investor in hedge funds, what do you think those innate characteristics are that you have that some of these other people that haven't chosen to continue when they're down that you might be able to anticipate ahead of time? Like I said, you have to love what you do. You have to do it for the right reasons. You have to do it because you love doing it, not for the money. All of us are highly competitive, but I really value the track record, the integrity, and the trust that investors have placed with me for so many years. I just think that would be so disappointing to fold up a shop during difficult times. The other thing is I was a big wrestler in junior high and high school, and there's a lot of tough times when you wrestle, and you wrestle some really pretty good wrestlers that are more experienced or a lot stronger, and you always battle back. That experience has been fantastic for me. I came from very humble beginnings. My grandfather was a coal miner outside of Pittsburgh, and he went black lung when I was born, so we had to move in with them, and he couldn't obviously work in the mines anymore, and so they baked Italian bread. My dad helped distribute it to the town and get the clients and that, and we didn't have enough money for a crib, so I slept in a drawer. You come from that, this other stuff is not so difficult. I feel so blessed, so excited for what I do every day. I think that's what you need. You need the tenacity. You got to feel really responsible for your investors. You got to feel like it really is on your shoulders and you really want to do well by them. I'm curious what you think your business looks like over the next couple of years. Well, I think it really is going to depend on how well we perform. As I said, I think it's going to be tough markets. It's possible the markets may bottom in the next six or seven months, but at probably at much lower levels than here. So how we can navigate that next 18 months to two years, I think would go a long way to determine what the business looks like two years from now. Rob, can't let you go without asking a couple of fun closing questions. So what's your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? Probably playing golf with my friends. We play a game called Wolf, which adds a little bit of wagering into it. Maybe sometimes it's a little wagering with a little golf along the way. (laughs) What's your biggest personal pet peeve? I guess people that are really full of themselves. That kind of bothers me. And I think it's one of the reasons that we live in Disney. If you live in Disney, you're pretty down to earth and want to enjoy life and want to do good things for others. 
So I think those who are full themselves and don't help others, I think is probably my biggest pet peeve. How about on the investment side, your biggest investment pet peeve? Short-term focus. I'll get tons of questions like, how come the last three weeks, this or that, or what happened three months ago in April? Time to me is a continuum, and I don't think about it in short-term months or days or weeks. We give weekly performance. I mean, I think that's kind of crazy, but we do it because our investors require it and want it. And so we want to provide as much transparency and everything we can to our investors that they require. But I think it's the short-termness of people's views. It's impossible to manage money on a short-term basis. Which two people have had the biggest impact on your professional life? George Soros and Julian Robertson. What's the biggest mistake you made and what did you learn from it? In 2019, we had two large positions that were required regulatory issues in the U.S. and the U.S. government to make certain issues. And under the Trump administration, things changed dramatically and they were never consistent. So we had two ideas that I think were great ideas, well-researched. I think we knew as much about them as possible. But the regulatory things changed, and they changed the rules of the game on us, and we lost a fair amount of money, and they were big positions. The positions were too big. We are betting on regulatory things. The size, in terms of liquidity, we wanted to change our mind. It made it very difficult to reduce the position. So I learned a ton from that. How big was too big in terms of position size? Between 10 and 15%. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? Always do the best job you can do, no matter what, and treat everyone, doesn't matter who it is, like you want to treat yourself. Last one, what life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? Change is really a positive thing. Sometimes we all are afraid of change. When I've made changes, they've generally been very positive things. We should never be afraid of change. From change comes growth. I think it's a great way for one to grow. I think I would have made more changes along the way. Always insightful, always a pleasure. Thanks so much for taking the time. My pleasure, Ted. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com, where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one, and see you next time.